Well, good afternoon, all. Uh, we return to our spinal cord injury lecture series. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Or perhaps you cannot hear me. Oh, you can hear me. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, we're going to continue on with uh, pain management after spinal cord injury. Um, we'll start uh, by going through some definitions and then discuss the anatomy and pathophysiology pe uh, peculiar to a spinal cord injury. I'll talk you through some of the um, recent changes in taxonomy in terms of how we identify pain after spinal cord injury. And then uh, we'll talk through some practical applications as we go along. So I, I think first off, uh, first and foremost, we have to recognize that none of us are supermen. Uh, even Superman, uh, unfortunately, had significant issues uh, with pain, um, both as the mythical figure, but as well as an individual with spinal cord injury years later. So we're gonna talk through the anatomy pathophysiology of pain specific to spinal cord injury, um, and then talk through the stepwise approach to managing that pain as we go through. So just to make sure that we're on the same page, I'm gonna be using the International Association for the Study of Pain definitions. So pain is described as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Um, of pain, there are two major, major types. Uh, there is no susceptive pain in which normal nerves are transmitting information to the central nervous system about trauma to tissues. And then neuropathic pain in which pain is uh, due to structural or functional nervous system adaptations uh, because of injury. Within neuropathic pain, there are several different uh, types. And so briefly, um, we'll talk through those. Allodynia is pain due to a stimulus which does not normally provoke, ouch, pain. Um, so we, we all uh, recognize, for example, uh, I've heard it described as when you hit uh, your funny bone or ulnar nerve at the elbow. Um, causalgia is a burning pain. Uh, so it includes allodynia as well as hyperpathia, uh, vasomotor, pseudomotor dysfunction after traumatic nerve lesion. Um, also referred to in, in the older days as reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Central pain is initiated or caused by a primary lesion within the central nervous system. Um, and we typically think about this uh, as uh, thalamic origin, for example, uh, within the brain. Uh, dysesthesias uh, are unpleasant abnormal sensations and those can be spontaneous or evoked. Um, hyperesthesia is increased sensitivity to stimulation, um, excluding the special senses. So it doesn't include things like hearing, taste, vision, those types of special senses. Hyperpathic pain is a syndrome characterized by abnormally painful reaction to a stimulus, especially a repetitive stimulus, repetitive stimulus. Neuralgia is pain in the distribution of a nerve or nerves. So dermatomal pain is how we would describe that. And paresthesias uh, are abnormal sensations. Those can be spontaneous or evoked typically associated with numbness um, as we talk through that. So we've got our, our key definitions um, as we talk about spinal cord injury. Remember that the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the cord. Um, as we talk through the somatic nervous system, we have motor function associated with each uh, level of, uh, of the uh, cervical, thoracic, lumbo, or sacral root. We also have the dermatomes as associated with those specific nerve roots. And then we have the autonomic uh, nervous system, which also plays into specifically the cord injury uh, with regard to its influence on the sympathetic nervous system, which arises from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. As we think about the cellular components of the central nervous system, and again, I'm gonna focus in on the areas below the brain, um, but essentially we have our nerve cells, remember nerve cells are gonna be conducting electrical impulses, but within the cord, uh, in addition to those nerve cells, and, and by the way, those only comprise about 10% of the total structures within the cord, um, we have a number of glial cells. So about 90% of the structural components of the cord are actually glial cells and do not conduct electrical activity. 
Uh, glial cells include oligodendrocytes, and those are responsible for the myelin uh, and subsequently the speed of transmission. Um, you have astrocytes. Astrocytes are essentially, essentially um, a passage between capillaries and nerves uh, to allow for uh, nutrition. Ependymal cells line the central nervous system and uh, they help to produce uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. The microglia are phagocytic uh, cells and these are there to, to clean up basically if there are damaged structures within the central nervous system, particularly within the cord. And then Schwann cells I bring up, obviously they are not um, part of the cord. They're actually uh, important for uh, myelination within the peripheral nervous system. Uh, but we do uh, see attempts to try to heal or repair the cord using Schwann cells. And so it's, it's helpful just to understand what, what, what they do in the peripheral nervous system and what we hope they would do in the central nervous system. So the neural tracts of the spinal cord uh, are, are, are fairly com complex. Uh, on this cartoon, basically I have uh, the uh, motor fibers on one side and the sensory fibers on the other side of this cartoon, recognizing that you truly have um, components of both on each side of the cord. And these are protected from each other very much like we think of bundles of electrical wiring. Um, and they have uh, fascicles within fascicles. Um, and so those um, are insulated from each other. Uh, and uh, essentially we shouldn't be sharing information on, uh, on a particular wire or a particular um, neural pathway. Uh, so those uh, influences are insulated from each other. Uh, so that passage of neur neural uh, activity um, is specific to its, its structure and its uh, projected use. So if we talk about conduction through the spinal cord injury, we have a number of descending tracts, including the cortical spinal tracts, the vestibulospinal, reticulospinal tracts. We also have a number of tracts that ascend the cord, and remember the cord is about the size of your little finger, uh, including spinothalamic, spinal reticular, and the dorsal columns. We have a peripheral nervous system in which we have afferent information coming into the cord at about one centimeter intervals um, and efferent information going out. Uh, this is typically motor uh, function. You have a number of inner neurons uh, between those at each level that are either facilitatory or inhibitory. And so this is a, a, a very basic cartoon of what the cord looks like and yet you can imagine if there was damage, um, all of those pathways in and out, up and down would be affected. So again, coming back to the neural tracts of the cord, as I talk about pain, I'm gonna talk about primarily the, um, the sensory sides. So remember, this is just a cartoon. Actually, you have uh, sensory fibers on both sides of the cord as you come through there. But we wanna focus on the spinothalamic, uh, the light touch pinprick and temperature sensation. The uh, spinal reticular, uh, which uh, provides information about deep pain, and then the dorsal columns, uh, which provide uh, proprioception, vibration, and light touch information. So all of these tracks are ascending the cord. Remember about the size of your little finger. Um, and, and I think that that uh, leads us to just uh, a quick discussion on the decusation of pathways, uh, particularly uh, we'll be talking about in the first four figures here, the uh, sensory pathways. So you have pain and temperature uh, coming in uh, from one side of the body um, and it crosses over and ascends uh, the cord um, uh, to the somatosensory uh, cortex. These are the spinothalamic uh, fibers. Position and vibration uh, comes in and ascends on the ipsilateral side of the cord, decussates at the level of the medulla to uh, cross over to the opposite somatosensory cortex. Light touch is redundant in that it uh, travels both ipsilaterally and contralaterally up the cord to get to the contralateral somatosensory cortex. And unconscious proprioception ascends the ipsilateral side of the cord uh, to send information to the cerebellum. And then obviously, um, 
al although it doesn't have much to do with uh, motor fun uh, I'm sorry, with uh, pain function, the um, motor cortex uh, basically sends information, crosses over at the medulla and, and goes down the contralateral side of the cord to provide uh, efferent information to the rest of the body. Now the pain pathways, um, we're gonna talk through primary, secondary, and tertiary afferents, um, recognizing that those are going to um, involve a number of neurotransmitters. So we'll be talking through those as well. Um, the primary afferents, most of you are very familiar with these. So this is the peripheral nervous system, um, takes information from the peripheral organ to the dorsal columns of the spinal cord. And you have basically three types. You have uh, one non-nociceptive and two nociceptive types of fibers. The non-nociceptive fibers are uh, A-beta uh, fibers. These are thick, uh, myelinated, large diameter and fast conducting fibers. They send information about low intensity, non-painful position vibration and light touch uh, to the um, opposite uh, somatosensory cortex. The A delta and the C fibers uh, conduct nociceptive pain. They respond to uh, the A delta fibers, respond to well localized sharp pain, and they're uh, part of the pain withdrawal process. They provide information that is thermical, I'm sorry, thermal, mechanical, and chemical uh, in nature. Um, moderately fast conducting, moderate diameter, thin, uh, thinly myelinated fibers. And then the C nociceptive um, fibers, uh, those are unmyelinated, small diameter and slow conducting. They provide uh, a variety of input from noxious stimuli, transmit poorly localized dull pain. Again, that can be thermal, mechanical or chemical in nature. So they, these primary afferents go from the organ to the dorsal columns of the cord. Secondary afferents then um, have their cell bodies in the dorsal columns and they go from the dorsal columns to the thalamus and to the brainstem, uh, the reticular uh, portions of the central nervous system. And then tertiary afferents go from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. So you have three levels of afferent pain transmission. Um, and we worry about uh, the primary and secondary afferents primarily with spinal cord injury because of uh, damage uh, to those. Now, the um, neurotransmitters uh, that uh, will convey pain mediating input uh, to the central nervous system um, include glutamate and aspartate uh, for the primary afferents, although there's a number of modulating um, neurotransmitters that can modify uh, what, what we are sensing. Uh, there are some descending inputs uh, that include glutamate, acetylcholine, serotonin, and dopamine, uh, notably, um, also can be modulated by somatostatin and, and substance P. And so these are, these are modifying uh, inputs uh, coming from the brain. You have local circuit interneurons that include glutamate, aspartate, glycine, GABA, and acetylcholine, um, again, with multiple modulators. Um, and then nonspecific targets. So these essentially neurotransmitters, these are gonna modify as well what we sense in terms of pain. So for example, the um, sodium uh, 1.7 voltage channels uh, convey pain and there's a specific genetic predisposition to these. So certain families have this incredible pain that is very, very difficult uh, to manage. Um, Second messengers can also uh, influence that. Then you have transsynaptic signals, including nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and prostaglandins, and other factors that can modulate pain uh, and its transmission include the neurotrophins and cannabinoids. So we're gonna talk through those, but recognize um, essentially when we look for uh, what is the source of neuropathic pain, um, there are uh, two primary uh, reasons for um, neuropathic pain. Um, part of this is structural reorganization of the cord and, and thalamus after damage. So um, this can be uh, because of a cordectomy, for example. You can have hyperreactivity and spontaneous activity and deafferentation models. 
You can have disinhibition or imbalance of the spinal pathways following spinal cord injury. There can be intraspinal sprouting of uh, both sensory and motor uh, pathways that can influence uh, how we perceive pain. And then potentially uh, blood brain barrier uh, and, and uh, cerebral spinal fluid abnormalities. Um, so part of this is because of structural reorganization after a cord injury. Part of it is also because of neurochemical changes, particularly excitatory amino acids that are released after spinal cord injury, for example, glutamate, and those contribute to hyperexcitability. So an increase in EPSPs, if you will. Um, there are also, at, at least initially, inflammatory uh, products and byproducts, and then the influence of the sympathetic nervous system um, on these as well. So let's just fix it. Let's just fix the spinal cord. Um, why, why don't we do that? Well, recognize again, that when you have damage to the cord, one of the first things that occur, remember you have all those glial cells, 90% um, of the cord in fact uh, is, is glial structures. And so soon after uh, a spinal cord injury, you have a 360 degree um, scar basically. And within that scar is uh, a cystic cavity, typically. Um, you would have to break through the, the glial scar, if you will, um, both uh, below and above in order to transmit information uh, from the body to the brain or from the brain to the cord. So, so that's one of the first things, you'd have to break through that glial scarring. The other thing is you'd have to get past this, uh, this chasm. And so you could put in uh, certain cell types or scaffolding. You could use Schwann cells, for example, or stem cells um, in order to create a scaffold for nerves to, to grow and to cross that, uh, that chasm. Um, but recognize, even if you were able to break through the glial scar and get across the chasm, you would still have to uh, get past a number of inhibitory proteins that occur after spinal cord injury particularly no-go proteins, myelin-associated glycoproteins, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and nuclear factor kappa B. All of these are, are hostile or toxic to neural uh, cells and as they try to grow through there. But let's say we could block those inhibitory proteins somehow. We would still have to have um, growth factors present at specific times in the neural cells uh, growth. Um, and those would have to be there in specific concentrations. And so this is nerve growth factors, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, glial-derived neurotrophic factors. So all of these growth factors would have to be present at specific times in the specific developmental stage of, of the neural, uh, uh, the neuron basically growing. But even if we could um, provide those, we could make up a cocktail somehow and put all of that there. The other thing that we're really struggling with is the directional guidance. How do we get the neurons to um, only communicate with the neurons that we want them to communicate above and or below? Because if you don't, you're gonna have these problems with neuropathic pain, um, misfirings basically, and um, uh, what you would uh, be perceiving as a significant pain and dysfunction uh, below the level of the injury. So there are a number of chemokines uh, present in neuropathic pain. Um, I've got those listed here. I'm not going to spend time on those because I want to move forward with some of these, but recognize both from the peripheral as well as the central nervous system, a number of these chemokines can increase the EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials that um, uh, are, are present uh, for efferent as well as afferent uh, nerve impulses. And so, um, so we're gonna talk through the treatment options for managing pain. Um, I guess before I get there, I, I need to take a moment and kind of talk us through the taxonomy uh, for uh, pain after spinal cord injury. So uh, Sedal uh, et al uh, reported before the turn of the century and right at the turn of the century, Bryson Ragnarsson uh, reported out uh, a, a pain taxonomy basically that described pain above the level of the injury, pain at the level of the injury, and pain below the level of the injury. And uh, for each of those, they listed nociceptive and neuropathic pain. Um, a few years later, they've uh, modified this pain taxonomy to say, uh, let's just call it all nociceptive 
or neuropathic, the nociceptive is musculoskeletal or visceral. The neuropathic is um, above, at, or below the level of the injury. And then more recently, uh, 2012 and 2016, they were updated again. Uh, the International Spinal Cord Injury Pain uh, Group uh, put together pain in terms of tiers, not, not tiers rolling from your eyes, but uh, tier one, tier two, or tier three. So tier one is no susceptive, neuropathic, other or unknown pain. Tier two is within that no susceptive pain, it can be either musculoskeletal, visceral, or other. Within the neuropathic type of pain, the tier two is at, below, or at the peripheral nerve. Um, and then for other pain, uh, we'd have to describe those a little bit more. So the tier three pain type, now you break down musculoskeletal, for example, into glenohumeral osteoarthritis or visceral pain, uh, for example, myocardial infarction or appendicitis. Um, neuropathic pain could be because of ner nerve root compression or cord ischemia or peripherally at the car carpal tunnel um, as we go through there. So, um, Sedal and Middleton reported out in 2006 a treatment um, algorithm uh, for pain. And, and I could go through these one at a time. I'm actually going to do a little bit better than that because this um, table is a little bit hard to, uh, to follow as we go through. So what I will do is I will break down by, um, you know, assessing the system, identifying the pain type, assessing the site, et cetera, on subsequent slides. And so the first thing uh, we're going to be looking at is the assessment. Um, so the system assessment, first thing you need to know is with spinal cord injury pain, is the pain located in a region of normal sensation? If yes, then you would call it nociceptive. If no, then it's neuropathic. Uh, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, so let's take a look at the site um, and determine if the uh, position, uh, I'm sorry, if the pain is position dependent, is it uh, related to activity or uh, somatic tenderness? Is it visceral related? Is it above, at, or below the level? So all of these things are gonna be important in ultimately um, deciding how we're gonna manage the pain. So uh, site assessment follows, uh, I'm sorry, what follows next is structural assessment. So are there autonomic signs and symptoms? Uh, so for example, complex regional pain syndrome used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, are there sensory or motor deficits on nerve conduction studies that would indicate a peripheral nerve uh, injury? Um, is there root compression on imaging studies uh, that would indicate a root lesion? Or is there a cystic cavity, for example, uh, that we can see on MRI? This is the structural assessment. Again, trying to figure out where and why uh, the pain is occurring. So whenever possible, treat the cause. So if it is, uh, we've determined that it's complex regional pain, a sympathetic block uh, would be in order. Uh, functional rehabilitation is gonna be helpful in some cases. Surgical decompression is gonna be necessary if you have a, uh, a, a situation with a nerve root compression. If you have a syrinx, uh, then you're gonna want to shunt and or detether. Um, so treat the cause if we can determine what the cause is. Um, treat the symptoms if we know that we're not going to be able to um, overcome the cause. And we're going to talk through first tier, second tier, and third tier treatment options. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk you through those as we get to each of these. Um, recognizing that no susceptive input is going to influence not just autonomic dysreflexia, but spasticity. And so as you have increased uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, those can also, those are gonna be sensed um, and ultimately increase the uh, reactivity of the sympathetic nervous system for folks with injuries above T6. Uh, but for increasing spasticity um, for folks who are at risk for spasticity, um, all of these things are gonna increase spasticity the spasticity is going to be synonymous uh, with the amount of pain typically the person is uh, sensing. Uh, they won't always sense the pain, uh, but if they do have pain uh, and, and uh, it's tied to spasticity, the more pain they have, the more spasticity they have. Um, so let's talk about pain above the level of the injury, uh, basically no susceptive or neuropathic. 
Uh, no susceptive typically is going to be uh, musculoskeletal, visceral, or autonomic. So we'll talk through that and then we'll talk through the neuropathic components. Um, no susceptive pain typically associated with upper extremity overuse, uh, for example. So spine degenerative changes above the level of the fusion, rotator cuff impingement, epicondylitis, de Quervain's tenosynovitis. So this is bread and butter for, for you know, typical uh, physical medicine intervention. Um, and we know that uh, doc, Dr. Vivas has recently reported out um, the uh, management of, of musculoskeletal pain above spinal cord injury is going to include home exercises. You can use these prophylactically, um, optimizing range of motion, positioning, and sleep, minimizing the noxious stimuli and treatment, as you would with most other physical uh, um, medicine aspects, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and um, drugs, uh, judicious steroid application, surgical options as, as necessary. Um, we know that not all nociceptive pain is musculoskeletal, however, so be, uh, be quick to take a look at cardiopulmonary uh, potential culprits. Uh, so the etiology could include myocardial infarction. Can get mixed up a bit with somebody with spinal cord injury. Um, uh, so if uh, the person's level of injury is above the uh, cardiac afferents, for example, they might only get autonomic dysreflexia. Um, so but we're, we're talking about, at the moment, we're talking about pain above the level of the injury. And so keep these things in mind um, as you would with able-bodied individuals. Um, cholecystitis can present and cause some radiating pain sometimes. Um, so and similarly for bladder uh, or renal calculi, so kidney stones, very, very painful, can feel like back pain, and yet uh, it's uh, genital urinary and not musculoskeletal. So treat the underlying cause when you can determine what that is. Neuropathic pain above the level of spinal cord injury is we would manage it the same way that we would treat anyone with neuropathic pain. Um, so for compressive neuropathies, uh, recognize that we're gonna try to decompress uh, when possible. Um, and so there's a number of different ways that we can do that for central uh, neuropathic pain above the level of the injury. So for example, you have an ascending syrinx, recognize that that's going to need to be um, decompressed. Uh, and, uh, and then you have other types of pain. So for example, TMJ, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, temporal arteritis, uh, all of those are gonna contribute. Now, neurogenic obesity is interesting. Um, and Dr. Felix and I just uh, submitted a manuscript on this. Um, and uh, basically we have found that these, some of the same uh, chemokines, um, and, and I will call them cytokines that are released from adipose tissue uh, can actually amplify neuropathic pain uh, above, at, or below the level of the injury. So. Um, more on that as, as we move forward. Um, managing neuropathic pain above the level of the injury. So as you would for able-bodied individuals, um, weight loss, uh, particularly adipose tissue loss is going to help us. Uh, some individuals may uh, respond well to TENS, the transcutaneous electroneuromuscular uh, stimulation. Um, and then uh, the appropriate use of NSAIDs, tricyclics and anticonvulsants. Surgical decompression is sometimes uh, indicated as well. So pain at and below the level of the spinal cord injury. Again, um, most of the times uh, we're gonna be talking about folks with incomplete spinal cord injury who are gonna be sensing this as pain above the level of the injury. Um, and, and the pain in that case may be nociceptive or neuropathic. Um, however, for those folks who aren't feeling pain per se, they're simply getting autonomic dysreflexia or increased spasticity, we're going to have to go fishing uh, for the underlying cause. Um, and so remember, autonomic dysreflexia is a massive sympathetic outflow in response to a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury in persons with T6 spinal cord injury and above. Um, and it has uh, significant complications associated with it. So we want to try to figure out that source. Now, the source um, of pain is not always going to be genital urinary, although that's the number one cause. Um, the number two cause is GI. The number three cause um, is open for interpretation, and it can be skin, could be musculoskeletal. 
So I guess what I want you to remember is if somebody is experiencing autonomic dysreflexia that, that is relatively new and different, um, you're going to have to go find the source of the afferent input that is ascending the cord but is blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury, resulting in a sympathetic outflow and splanchnic vasoconstriction, hypertension, increased blood pressure, causing uh, basically input from the dura receptors to the medulla that sends information back to the heart, causing a relative bradycardia. Uh, but below the level of the injury, the person will remain vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, flushing, sweating, pounding, headache, we attribute to autonomic dysreflexia. Now, the key thing here in pain management, when you see autonomic dysreflexia, you need to be thinking pain, something below the level of the injury. If it's not bladder and it's not bowel and it's not skin, uh, you have to start looking for other sources. And remember that... Um, all of those things that you treat in able-bodied individuals as pain. Um, so degenerative changes in the spine, uh, nerve compression uh, because of foraminal stenosis, um, osteoarthritis at the hip or knee. All of those things can be causing autonomic dysreflexia or spasticity in a person with spinal cord injury. And so you're going to have to go through and go fishing to determine what the course uh, or what the cause uh, that is uh, for uh, these particular folks. And you all know how to manage autonomic dysreflexia, but you also know that pharmacologically managing autonomic dysreflexia is just a short term, it's a Band-Aid cause uh, or a, a Band-Aid treatment. Uh, you've got to find the cause or the person is likely to continue to have problems um, and ultimately die of some of the dysfunctions that we talked about uh, earlier. So all of these things need to be in your differential diagnosis. Um, if the person has an incomplete spinal cord injury and they're reporting pain on you know, the left uh, lower quadrant of their abdomen, recognize that that pain may be um, uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, they may actually be experiencing right hip osteoarthritis and it's presenting to their brain as left lower quadrant pain. Um, you start to get these mixed signals after a spinal cord injury. So it's important that you go fishing and consider what the potential sources are um, as you go through this type of thing. Also remember that visceral pain below the level of the injury can be contributing to um, the sensation of pain uh, for somebody with an incomplete spinal cord injury and or autonomic dysreflexia and spasticity. Uh, so in this case, the autonomic dysreflexia or spasticity are simply, they're, they're the presenting symptoms of something that's happening below the level of the spinal cord injury. So um, managing, finding first off, uh, if it's neuropathic pain, um, is it because of a syrinx or tethering? Is there new trauma um, or a tumor? Um, all of which can be painful for a person without spinal cord injury, but with spinal cord injury, uh, you may or may not get a uh, painful sensation. So uh, if it's ridiculous and you're able to identify, that's great. Uh, it could be a specific root level. And, and so you could consider managing that uh, with interventional procedures um, as you would do otherwise. Similarly, complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, if, if you see pseudomotor changes and you've ruled out a DVT, for example, in the lower extremity, um, consider doing a nerve block. Uh, that may be helpful for you. So the management strategies that you apply to able-bodied individuals can be applied to persons with spinal cord injury, but you need to first identify the cause. Um, so again, neuropathic pain at or below the level of the injury, uh, treat with a block if you know that that's the case. If it seems that neurogenic obesity is contributing, also try to reduce uh, adipose tissue. Pharmacologically, uh, you can use tricyclic antidepressants, um, so amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Um, amitriptyline is, is great for people who are having difficulty sleeping because it will help them be sleepy as well. Nortriptyline for those folks who don't seem to have or be, uh, become somewhat lethargic and sleepy because of medications, nortriptyline would be a better option in that case. Um, Anticonvulsants, including uh, gabapentin, 
uh, carbamazepine, and uh, you know, as you go higher and higher up your uh, list, pregabalin. Um, surgical decompression and dorsal column stimulators may be indicated in certain circumstances. So this is where it's helpful to, to have the pain background that you all have. And or if you're not particularly um, uh, geared towards interventional procedures, knowing that you can refer to our interventionalists. Um, so again, treatment options. We're going to talk through the pharmacological uh, management strategies uh, before we get to interventional and non-pharmacological options. So typically, no susceptive pain, you consider using acetaminophen and anti-inflammatory agents. Um, Opioids acutely, but again, opioids are, are not our go-to um, if we can stay away from them. Uh, if you have neuropathic pain and you've identified it appropriately, first tier would be a sympathetic blockade. A lidocaine patch can be helpful acutely and or consider uh, gabapentin, uh, membrane stabilizing agents uh, chronically. Second tier, uh, if you've got gabapentin on board, consider uh, adding in a tricyclic antidepressant um, or tramadol. Uh, so adding in, uh, when you have gabapentin on board, try to max that out um, and then consider adding in a tricyclic antidepressant, particularly, uh, so if a person is having difficulty uh, with neuropathic pain, keeping them awake, um, then adding in amitriptyline at night, low dose. Again, we're talking doses uh, that are much lower than you would use for managing depression. So uh, amitriptyline, for example, starting with 10 or 25 or 50, uh, depending upon the age of, of the uh, patient, um, would be very reasonable. If um, sleep isn't a problem, but the neuropathic pain is, consider using nortriptyline, especially if they've been getting somewhat uh, sleep in lethargic uh, using gabapentin. Third tier is to uh, switch from gabapentin to pregabalin. Uh, again, I really do try to steer clear of the opioids. Consider intrathecal uh, medications um, and then non-pharmacological options, including uh, transcutaneous uh, electroneuromuscular stimulation, acupuncture, dorsal column stimulators, um, and uh, to get a little bit more invasive dorsal root end zone uh, uh, interventions or cordotomies. Um, opioids, uh, uh, just a reminder, you all know this, but don't choose opioids uh, as your first choice treatment uh, for neuropathic pain. Um, we want to try to stay away from them as much as possible. What about the use of cannabinoids? Um, uh, so marijuana. Um, been used for many, many years. Yes, way back in my day as an intern and a residence, I had patients with spinal cord injury who chose not to take the medications we prescribed because you know what? Marijuana did it for them. Um, and so in California, that became a little bit more um, available, more so uh, as well in uh, Oregon and, and Seattle. Um, but uh, if you wanted to stay legal, uh, then we've been moving forward with actually looking at uh, treatment trials for the use of uh, marijuana cannabis for treating uh, pain. So remember that um, the marijuana has uh, psychoactive and non-psychoactive components to it. So the psychoactive include THC, that's tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, and so you can uh, purchase these now um, at pharmaceuticals through uh, cannabis sativa or cannabis indica. The um, cannabinoids, uh, the non-psychoactive uh, drugs are the cannabis uh, ruderalis. Um, and uh, they also seem to have some anti-inflammatory uh, characteristics by inhibiting their arachidonic acid conversion by cyclooxygenase. However, if you look at the data that's out there, we don't have a lot to go on yet. Um, Holly reported out in 2018, and this is a, a, a group of patients in Colorado uh, using cannabis. Um, this is 27 individuals, uh, two thirds of them had previously used before their spinal cord injury uh, cannabis. Um, and their reasons for using medications now included uh, spasticity management. 70% of them said uh, they were using primarily to manage their spasticity. 
63%, um, so about two thirds were using it for recreation and sleep and 60% for pain management. Um, now this, this was just an across the board, just a cross section of uh, 27 individuals with spinal cord injury who reported using cannabis. Anderson uh, reported out in 2017, the use of cannabis in Denmark. And so they had over 500 individuals, 80% of them had used it prior to their spinal cord injury, but now they were using it for 81% um, recreation and pleasure. Uh, but 60% for spasticity and pain management. And then uh, Wilsey, a few years before that, and this is one of the few uh, um, actual trials, they used a crossover randomized controlled trial with vaporized cannabis uh, versus placebo. Um, and they had uh, ba basically the placebo uh, is listed as P. They had a low dose and then a high dose vaporized cannabis uh, primarily to manage neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury. So 42 individuals received um, all three uh, versions um, and uh, they reported out their visual analog scores. Um, basically uh, the placebo group, not quite so good. The, the low uh, vaporized group uh, improved by one and a half points on a visual analog score. And those that used the higher dose uh, moved up two points. I'm sorry, moved down two points. I had that reverse, sorry. Um, down two points on the visual analog scale. So um, they um, all in general reported a 30% reduction in pain. The placebo dropped pain by 45%, the low dose uh, by 70%, and the high dose by 88%. So um, uh, we need to be moving forward with these trials uh, and looking at them ideally for management of neuropathic pain as well as for spasticity uh, management. Um, so briefly to talk through some non-pharmacological options, um, sleep, exercise, and diet uh, have huge roles to play. So a lack of sleep or poor exercise and poor diet uh, really amplify the uh, aspects of both nociceptive and neuropathic pain. And so trying to optimize sleep, trying to optimize diet and exercise uh, obviously is gonna be helpful. There are some studies of acupuncture above and below the level of the injury. There's not enough for me to uh, clearly indicate their efficacy, uh, unfortunately. Massage is especially helpful for folks uh, whose uh, pain is above the level of their injury, um, as is TENS uh, and the application of TENS. Um, and then psychological interventions. And so we have our, our uh, rehab psychologists uh, who can help our patients, especially in the acute phase of rehabilitation with cognitive behavioral therapies, appropriate breathing exercises, uh, behavioral activation and relaxation techniques, um, and then uh, depending upon the scenario, uh, it may be necessary to use interventional or surgical uh, techniques as we go through there. So I've, I've run through uh, uh, pain management of spinal cord injury relatively quickly, um, but I wanted to leave some time for you all to ask questions. And so uh, let's open it up now for questions and uh, see if I can answer uh, things that you maybe feel that I haven't answered appropriately to date. So I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. Um, feel free to come on and ask verbally or through the chat, either way. Hey, Dr. Gator, how are you doing? Good. Is this Dr. Acosta? It is. I had a quick question. Um, this is your forehead. It's, it's a little <laughs> spooky. So for patients, like I remember I had a patient early, early on in the year who had a, a tumor resection in the lower sacral lovers, and then he had severe neuropathic pain. Um, how frequently do spinal cord injury or tumor resection patients with severe neuropathic pain get um, like spinal cord stimulators? Oh, I don't know that for sure. Um, I think that it, uh, part of it depends on our um, referral patterns. Um, I'm relatively quick, if I've determined that that's going to be the nature of the beast, relatively quick to uh, move forward uh, with a discussion with our neurosurgeons and our interventionalists. Um, 
when I was practicing at Michigan, uh, Tony Kyoto was kind of my go-to guy. He's board certified in spinal cord injury as well as pain and probably has as much experience as anybody in the field managing those types of scenarios uh, with a spinal cord stimulator or not. Um, that said, I think that if we can identify, make the appropriate referral to our interventionalists, uh, be they physiatrists, anesthesiologists, or interventional radiologists, of course, I'm biased towards physiatry, uh, but I think that there uh, certainly is a, uh, an appropriate time uh, to use this. Thanks. Again, I'm going through the different tiers first. Hey there, Dr. Gator. Um, thanks for the great instruction. Uh, I had a question about the barriers to spinal cord injury repair, and I think you did a great job kind of illustrating some of the some of the challenges that are going on. But uh, just the bigger landscape, are people trying to find solutions to these ba barriers that you you've uh, you've identified, or are we trying to kind of find a solution that circumducts you know that area of damaged spine to to try to resolve the issue? Yeah, great question. I have a whole separate lecture just on uh, the potential repair of spinal cord injury. Here we are in Miami, uh, in, in the very home of the Miami Project. And for 30 plus years, that has been um, a, a major, and they go both ways. Uh, yes, they are trying to look for repair, regeneration of the cord, as well as circumducting and improve function and or reducing pain afterwards. Uh, the nice thing is we've got investigators uh, looking at both of those um, options, um, and uh, that's, uh, you know, at the preclinical as well as the clinical level. So, um, you know, Barth Green, uh, Alan Levy, um, Dr. Guest, uh, all of them, uh, and, and obviously Dalton Dietrich and, and crew have been looking towards um, ways that we can uh, treat spinal cord injury. Damien Pierce, there's a whole host of folks that I'm, I'm not naming, uh, and so I'm gonna get in trouble, uh, but just recognize that yes, that's a big part of what the Miami Project is all about and what the Bonacati Foundation um, has been uh, geared towards trying to fix, but uh, the other side of it is uh, if we can't fix it, um, how do we optimize function, optimize life uh, and life quality for those um, all of you remember that um, when Kim Anderson did her, uh, her um, poll of all persons with spinal cord injury way back, I think she reported out in 2010, uh, the three major areas that most people were interested in had to do with uh, bowel, bladder, and sex. Uh, but not far down on the list was pain management. And so we continue to have to take a look at that. Surprisingly, many folks think that, oh, they just, they want to regain function. Um, and regain walking. And yet many folks with spinal cord injury would uh, uh, refute that and say, no, 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 manage my pain, manage my bladder, my bowel, help me enjoy sexuality again. Um, and so all of these things are areas uh, that are open for discussion and open for investigation. And the Miami Project has been doing great things uh, for many, many years on those, on those lines. Other thoughts, questions, concerns? I also had a, another question, Dr. Gator, about uh, pregabalin um, versus gabapentin in terms of how you, the different tiers, why you progress, uh, why do, do we wait so long before we go to pregabalin relative to gabapentin? That's money, okay. Yeah. Money, uh, Un yeah. unfortunately, yes. Uh, the gabapentin has been off patent for a while and is not as expensive. Uh, the pregabalin, someday we may get there as well. Uh, but for now, um, the uh, most insurance companies are going to require us to move forward in a progression where we use the least expensive first, um, even though it may be uh, least sensitive and uh, less efficacious. But if it works, then why would you want to move forward to a more expensive agent? Um, and, and I certainly understand that. But we don't dawdle. Um, as if we find that uh, we've maxed out, for example, using uh, Neurontin and we tried to add in a tricyclic and it's not been effective, then it's appropriate to move on to the pregabalin. Uh, 
But again, oftentimes, more so as an outpatient than an inpatient, uh, you have to get approval uh, from the insurance company before they, or the person ends up having to pay out of pocket, which some people feel, um, you know, is warranted. Hey, Dr. Gator. Uh, Rick here. Uh, great talk. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback kind of off of Oliver's question um, regarding spinal cord stimulation and neuropathic pain for spinal cord injury. Um, so currently, the I think the CAN pain clinical practice guidelines kind of don't list it as, as a recommended for or against because there's not enough evidence yet. Um, but as I was reading, um, in addition to the gate theory mechanism of blocking pain, uh, some studies have shown that it actually inhibits glial cells and gliosis and reduces like substance P, nitrous oxide, and free radicals. Um, I was wondering if you knew of any current studies going on to examine this further because I guess it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, it, it's great in theory, but um, like the systematic review that was done in 2019, only one case report had the spinal cord simulator placed below the level of the injury. So I was wondering how it had those effects if it was placed above in order to block the gate theory where it's having these you know, direct um, cytogenic effects at the level of the injury. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I can answer that. Obviously there have been uh, a number of trials that have been trying to figure out um, fore and aft. So, uh, so the stimulator is also used to stimulate and, and provide epidural uh, stimulation to try to promote motor recovery. Um, and so I think that moving forward, as we, as we look at placement options above, below, um, we also should be taking a look at, um, you know, the efficacy and what's changing within the environment. So I think our electrophysiologists um, who are recording function below as well as above those stimulators are going to be important for us to figure out. Um, I, I don't know why, and, and this is a little bit of the black box associated with epidural stimulation after spinal cord injury. Some folks, um, you look at uh, the work that's going on at the University of Louisville in uh, Susie Harkman's laboratory at Al. Um, they are uh, showing some folks improving in pain, some folks recovering motor function, some folks recovering bowel and bladder function, and yet we don't know exactly why that is. Um, and so uh, I think that's, that's a great question. I don't have an answer. I continue to look at the, uh, the work that's being done out of her laboratory and many others, including here at, at Miami. Um, and um, hopefully someday we will understand this circuitry a little bit better, well, a lot better, uh, so that we know how to um, enhance recovery and to, uh, if we can't uh, repair, um, how can we bypass appropriately? But, but I agree, um, while we've been looking primarily southward, trying to improve um, efferent motor activity and that type of thing, we also need to be looking northward and seeing what we can do um, you know, uh, above uh, the level of the spinal cord injury as well. Great, uh, great insights uh, from, from all of you. I just don't have the answers for you. Thank you. Uh, what what did you say her name was? The Susie Harkema uh, has has uh, published quite a bit, and a lot of things have, have come out since that time. Um, but Monica Perez, um, who was uh, previously here, um, I think that uh, Jim Guest is a neurophysiologist here. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon uh, who's worked with the Miami Project for twenty plus years. Uh, is also doing a fair amount of work. Katie Gant is unfortunately going to be leaving us, um, also looking at some of this. And our very own uh, Dr. Felix uh, had trained in um, Eva, um, oh, I just lost her last name. Somebody help me out here. Uh, Weidestrom's, uh, I'm not sure I have that right, uh, but looking at pain and neuropathic pain and um, managing uh, neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury. So um, anyway, we've, we've got folks here. Uh, there are, are a lot of um, investigators uh, across the country and across the world that are looking at this. Um, unfortunately, things are still looking a little bit black box-ish. Box -ish. Um, and I don't have the, um, you know, we all want to know why does it work if it works. Um, and uh, the mechanisms, uh, have eluded us uh, to date, but we'll keep looking.
Great. Well, thank you all for uh, participating. If you do have additional questions, feel free to uh, send those to me. Um, it's, it's always delightful to, to see you participating and not falling asleep in the midst of uh, some of these uh, complicated and, and dare I say somewhat boring lectures. So to me, it's exciting. Um, uh, to, to you, hopefully it's also exciting. So thank you for your time, energy and participation. Um, I'll see you in weeks to come.